hand back to continued programming with the Atlantic Council. And um, Dan Murphy, correspondent from CNBC, is standing by, and I know he's going to have a conversation with Irina. So, Dan, I'm going to hand it over to you. Very well timed, Edna Trainer. Thank you very much for bringing me in. Hi, everyone. My name is Dan Murphy. I'm from CNBC International, coming to you live this evening from CNBC's headquarters here in Dubai. And very pleased to join in the conversation. I'm looking forward to our next guest joining us on the program, which is, of course, Mr. Francesco La Camera, the Director General of the International Renewable Energy Agency, to talk about some landmark moves that have been made in this space just over the past 24 hours and indeed over the past 12 months as well. So, Mr. La Camera, welcome into the conversation. It's great to have you. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. So I thought we could begin our conversation on this historic transition that we've just seen underway in the United States. Uh, the President, Joe Biden, pledging to bring the United States back into the Paris Climate Accords and at the same time announcing a major investment into renewable energy and uh, a pledge as well to bring the United States into the modern era in a very, very green way. So my first question to you, sir, is how do you view this historic Biden transition and what it means for the renewable energy world? I think it, it means uh, a lot for the renewable world, but uh, for the energy transition as such. First of all, it's, uh, it's a very important moment at the beginning of this year, that is the year of the, the COP. So it's a very good uh, start of the year in this perspective. It's also a very good uh, start uh, because this will be also the year of the high-level dialogue on energy in the occasion of the General Assembly uh, this year in September. So it's coming really in the right moment. And uh, we uh, learned in the, this day of the assembly that uh, the new administration think to, to commit to go for 100% renewable clean energy in 2035. So it's a very good objective to be carbon neutral in 2050. So naturally, this will be a big push, not only for decreasing the CO2 emission, but to giving to the market a right signal signals that are coming from many parts of the world in this in this month in this last month but naturally uh, coming from uh, one of the two on the world superpower one of the big emitter in the world this sign is, is really really crucial it's very important so I from what we know difference. from what we know so far what what score would you give the biden energy agenda is it too soon to say that this might be a 10 out of 10 you know, that's, uh, uh, <laughs> the commitment are really very high and also very difficult to get. So uh, I hope that they will, uh, they will uh, uh, say, fulfill their, their commitment. If they do so, I think it would be very good improvement and a big acceleration in the energy transition, in my point of view. Because, you know, the speed of the energy transition is also linked to the right sign that you are going to give to the market. So a superpower as the US is giving this, uh, this, uh, this target, I think it's very good. Honestly, it's very good. I also wanted to ask you about some of the happenings at IRENA as well, because IRENA has just wrapped up its annual assembly. What are some of the key themes that you've been hearing from ministers over the past few days, and in particular, their plans to build on this political momentum that we now see out of the United States and elsewhere around the world to accelerate this green economic recovery through the use of renewables and others? You know, that's, uh, uh, we, before the General Assembly, we are saying that uh, this could be a first moment to set the tone of this year. And I think it was more than I expected. I was ultimate by the, the commitment of all uh, the uh, participants that has intervened in the debate. So it's not only United States now, China, 2060 carbon neutral, South Africa, 2050 carbon neutral, the EU, that uh, the Japan, South Korea, but uh, all other countries around the world, India, others, Indonesia that are moving this in this, in this direction. Naturally, we are talking about uh, commitment and pledge. We have to see this happening in the reality. But what we are, have assisted in our General Assembly, honestly, is uh, more than we accepted. And also from our point of view, it's been very important that uh, all the membership, I don't know, uh, we have 163 members now, and 
21 and the, in the access. So we are a global, we are the uniglobal uh, uh, agency working on, on, on energy. That uh, the role of uh, ARENA as the uh, lead of, of the energy transition has been recognized by our membership. So for us, it's also important and empowering us, encouraging us to go further in our work. Hmm. And through this process, this might seem like a really simple question, but through this process, was there something that you learned that you didn't already know? Well, I think that what we learned from the United States is, is more than we expected. In some ways, uh, I was not yet published this, uh, uh, published enough for this uh, goal of 100% uh, clean energy by 2035. I think it is something that uh, was really, really new. But what is uh, my point of view, and uh, I just told you, is uh, this sense of a commitment, the general commitment. Though there were no voice against, voice in favor, voice so and so. But we are all committed to do this. And uh, I think it was, uh, was a fantastic moment, honestly. Then we will see if from the political uh, declaration, uh, it will come the reality, but uh, I'm optimistic that something is changed. Also because of the experience we had in the last year and the moment we are believing. Absolutely, and the politics are of course hard to predict, but let's hope some of those words turn into actions. Um, Mr. Le Camera, also with regards to the energy investment that we're likely to see throughout the course of this year, where are we going to see the biggest investments in renewables in 2021? And is there one particular sector or one particular technology that stands out to you right now? Uh, I think that uh, then the first thing that we can say concerning investment is that uh, the last year, because we have to link, because of what is happened in the last year has been uh, uh, important to understand uh, what is going to happen. And what we have assisted as Possibly, I should say, we predicted already at the start of the, of the pandemic that the uh, renewable energy sector has not been impacted heavily from the pandemic. So we will discover that the uh, uh, zero between the two paths of installed capacity of renewables and the installed capacity in the traditional plant will be growing this year dramatically. So this brings us to say that uh, uh, the investment in renewables will continue. But you make also a point that I, I, I capture is when we are talking about technologies. So surely solar wind will go, uh, will go very well. We will have also thinking about uh, uh, hydropower where we have to renew all the existing uh, power because when I talk about renewables, I like to talk about everything. And we have innovation. We have innovation linked to the, the, the pilot study on the use of uh, energy coming from tidal energy, so the ocean energy. We have a strong commitment from Canada, other country we learn in this uh, the General Assembly on working on it. And hopefully they may become something that could be ready for the market. And also we have to understand that concerning green hydrogen, concerning bioenergy, still we don't have a consolidated choice from a governance and technology point of view. So this will be uh, the need for more innovation to see what could be the best way to, to, to go uh, forward. And as we come into the new year, give me a pulse check on where we're at today. How soon before we have scaled renewables as a viable alternative to fossil fuels? Um, I'm out here in the Middle East. I speak to the leaders and energy ministers of these petro economies on a weekly basis, getting an update on uh, what they're doing in their own sectors. And the impression that I get is that clearly in this part of the world, at least, um, renewables as a source of primary energy is still a very, very long way away. And at the same time, if you look at the buyers of the crude in this part of the world, which is predominantly customers in Asia, like India and China, for example, they too are a long way away from having scaled renewables as a viable alternative. So what does the time frame look like with the technology that we have today? So uh, you deserve a, a complex <laughs> and articulate response. So first of all, uh, we, are, we are living in a world where we know from, uh, from the science that if you want to go to 1.5 uh, uh, limiting the, the, the increase in, in global temperature, we have already Pick, uh, pick it concerning oil and gas production today. 
and we have to peak in 2025 for gas. So just to give you an idea very roughly, one third today is coming from renewable when we talk about energy, two thirds is coming from the traditional uh, way to, to, to produce energy. In 2050, this election has to be reserved. So we will have a two thirds from renewables, one third from the fossil fuel part. So naturally, and this, this has to go in this way, if you want to be coherent with our, our commitment. Naturally, this doesn't mean that in all region, in all country, we will have the same mix. So this could be possible that in certain country, we may have a, a certain uh, maintaining some kind of uh, 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 oil and gas production because the, the oil will be there also in 2050. It will be less oil, but there will be a, a, a part of it. As the gas will remain, and hopefully, in this one third of the fossil fuel, um, of the fossil fuel, we will have the gas having a major role respect and naturally oil and carbon. Carbon has to be just abandoned as soon as uh, as possible. So we have a global goal. We know that we have to work everyone on on that goal, but naturally the mix could be different in different region. And this is regarding also the, the, the technology. So there are technologies like CCS, uh, CCUS that may have a logic in certain parts of the world, but globally speaking, CCS and CCUS will count two or 4% of the reduction of CO2 in 2050, no more than that. But this could be 20% in one region, nothing in another. I hope that I've been clear. And uh, of course, you would expect the oil exporting economies of the Middle East to perhaps be at the other side of that curve. Economies across Europe might be a little more advanced, but um, either way, there's still an ongoing question about where we're at with regards to fossil fuels and this question of peak oil. And I thought I might put this to you as well. Um, do you think we are at or near peak oil or are we past that point? Yeah, concerning oil, I think yes. And uh, Dan, to respond directly, there is no competition in the power system between renewables and the conventional fuels. There is no competition. Where we have still uh, difficulties for the decarbonization, because it's difficult to electrify, are the uh, heavy industry sector. So I talk about cement, I'm talking big petrol chemical. So the big industries, where renewables may have difficulties to electrify their needs. The, the long transport is where we, renewables may have some difficulties. And this is coming, uh, green hydrogen that can complement the renewables in this effort. So we see uh, the energy future, the, the future of energy mix as based on renewables, complemented by green hydrogen and bioenergy. On these two, uh, we have to still work to, to find the right solution, but it's already there. And then that will be where we are going. And uh, again, I wish to emphasize on power, so on producing electricity, there is no competition. Mm -hmm. We estimate that next year, 1,200 gigawatts of uh, coal energy production will be produced, will be working less economically if it just a substitute. So if we make the investment. So maintenance costs are more the investment and maintenance cost together. This forgive you that this is a, a really turning point. We are very close to it. Mm. Fascinating. So with that in mind, what would you say are the main obstacles that we face today when it comes to achieving uh, net zero global emissions? What's holding us back? So uh, one is already touched and I can elaborate on that. But there is another point that uh, uh, should be considered. So when you are going to get some results, some goals, you have to have 1.5 maintain the degrees of the temperature in 2050, okay? This is the Paris Agreement. So we have, you have to lay down a theory of change, how to get there. The fact is that when you talk about change, the mystery of change is that uh, we know what we are risk to lose 
but we don't know exactly what we are going to, to, to get. So naturally there is a, a natural, a human, in some way, we can talk about the interest, etc. but there is the possibility of uh, a difficult, a cultural difficult to understand the possible benefit of, uh, of, of the change. But it's something that slowly is becoming or overcoming. The other thing, is, uh, as I told you, on uh, is the difficulties to um, to electrify this uh, this heavy sector, and they are coming as the op of uh, green hydrogen. Or, or already, there uh, you know that hydrogen uh, uh, nowadays is produced mainly to fossil fuel, so coal uh, and uh, oil and 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 gas. Naturally, gas is much better than the other two. So we are moving from degree, hopefully we abandon soon to the blue hydrogen and uh, blue hydrogen will be coupled by, uh, by uh, green hydrogen and then blue hydrogen will leave the 100% field to, to the ground. It's what we see the situation. And uh, uh, I can say then is where we are going. We have no doubts. I also wanted to ask you about the response that you've seen so far from IOCs and NOCs, um, these businesses receive significant subsidies. And I know this is an ongoing conversation within the renewable space as well. Um, what is the agency doing to get subsidy reform moving in the right direction? Because some would say that this is still a major barrier to achieving um, net zero emissions globally. You know, what, what, what we can say is as a, in the General Assembly asking for cutting the fossil fuel subsidies. Naturally, we have no power of uh, imposing to everyone anything. But we are uh, trying to, to make clear how this is possible. And we have already some country that is also unexpected country that, that is starting to, to cut their subsidies because uh, they have to uh, understand how could be possible cutting the, these subsidies to go for a new form of energy that may be more economical. Mm -hmm. This is particularly important for the small island because there, there is no a large market. So there, the action of organization as arena is very important. We have uh, um, established in collaboration with the UNDP, C for All, in collaboration with the Green Climate Fund, the Climate Investment Platform. So our idea is that uh, you know, traditionally, arena has been a, a, a think tank a knowledge basis agency. And we have the most tremendous knowledge in energy transition. We are trying to put this knowledge on the ground to facilitate social implementation. So we are working with country, we are supporting now 17 countries in uh, elaborating their national development contribution. You know, these are the document that is being prepared towards the COP26. Is the energy planning of those countries more or less. So we are trying to work in a way to incorporate in their commitment and pledge the uh, abandon of the fossil fuel to renewables. Naturally, we have to accompany this. We have also joined with uh, Rockefeller Foundation. Now we have all the multilateral financial institutions with us. The, uh, but the critical point is that in certain parts of the world, the concessional, the concessional uh, loan is not working. We need also a big part of, of a grant. And this, honestly, I would say, we have, uh, have been very supported by, by our also the UAE. We have an agreement with the uh, Abu Dhabi Development Bank. We have uh, funded projects in the, in the last seven years. We are going to working for establishing a new facility. And I hope that this will facilitate in this part of the region. The priority for myself, for the agency, the least developed country, and the small islands, where through these finance funds, we can really make the matching between the needs and the financial human resources needed. So this is my hope. Um, I asked you to uh, give a score earlier with regards to the, the, the Biden administration's uh, energy and climate policy. What scorecard would you give these international oil companies, national oil companies on the progress that they've made with regards to investing in renewables pivoting their business um, and the state of that sector today? Do you think there's still more work to be done or are you encouraged with the progress that you've seen so far? So Dan, concerning scoring, uh, we are never 
you will, you will never be listening us to scoring someone. <laughs> some, some member states will never do that. So this will become from a, a work for journalists, but not for me. I don't score. I, as I told you, I'm very, I'm very uh, open that uh, the commitment will become a reality and it was, will change really the reality, globally speaking. Concerning oil gas company, uh, ARENA and the General Assembly has encouraged us to be in contact with them. We want to work with them. I think it is important that we work with them and uh, I have to say also giving more strength to our scenario and let them understand how through moving in the direction that we are indicating, they can uh, uh, make the, the profit they need uh, as uh, any company. And it, what is important, but they know probably much better than us, uh, naturally anyone wants to make the, the last penny of the investment they did. But the fact is that the new investment in fossil fuel will be the standard asset of the future. And we have to be very careful, uh, Dan, because now we have the liquidity. The, the COVID has not impacted the financial market. But if we don't make the right choice, and if we invest the money that is available, is stranded asset, this will uh, touch also the health of the financial system. So I hope that this could be made clear to the oil gas company. We have uh, set guidelines for working with them we are in contact with uh, a few of them, British Petroleum, uh, ENI, and uh, Aramco, and uh, we want to work with them. We think we need them, and uh, we have to, to work together for strengthening the culture of the change in our society, in our economy, and so in the energy system. Mm. And it really does feel like we're at such a critical time in this conversation, so it's a really important one to be had. We have a few minutes left in this discussion. So if you are watching and if you would like to join in, please feel free to send us a question and we can put those uh, questions to uh, Mr. Lakamra. Uh, in the meantime, though, I thought we could maybe pivot the conversation towards uh, an area that we often talk about over on CNBC and from a journalist perspective, which is uh, geopolitics. What do you see as the biggest risk in energy geopolitics in 2021? Uh... Risks, uh, possible. <laughs> I know that puts you on the spot. <laughs> yeah. That is a hard one. Uh, Dan, because I don't know if uh, we may have the, the, the time. I will come back to and respond precisely to this because we are we are working on geopolitics. One thing that's uh, concerning also the difficulties uh, is that, uh, and when we talk about the theory of, chan of change, <clears throat> that uh, we are not just talking about substituting one fuel with another. We are talking about building a new system, different of the past. This means that we are moving from a centralized system to a decentralized one, a system where consumer, prosumer will play a role, a system that has to work on the basis of the maximum flexibility and interconnectivity, interconnectivity where artificial intelligence will play a major role. So this has to be understood. We are not just changing from fossil fuel to renewable. We are building something different that could provide for a more resilient, and I wish to say also a fairer energy system, a system that could be more just. On geopolitics, the benefits are that uh, uh, the um, all geopolitics will change. Because, because countries may be able to produce much of their energy they need domestically. Naturally, it's open. Also the problem of uh, the raw material, the, the red earth and mineral. So we have to be careful that this will be uh, working in a way that uh, there will be a market, there will be transparent, so that everyone can, we don't think that will be any risk of restraint because of a mineral of rare earth. But the market has to be transparent, uh, transparent and work effectively. And we also work and we had also an initiative with uh, all the US administration to try to work to ensure that also the, the exploitment for mineral respect health and work rules that sometimes are, 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 are under in, uh, infringement. Naturally, this will change the geography. We have seen now this 
uh, uh, this agreement with Morocco and Germany that could shape the way developed country and uh, develop, developed country may, may de have a dialogue on hydrogen, for example. This will change. Everyone that have the sun, that have the wind, now is, can become a producer, can become an exporter, and get into the price the better, the better, the, to market the better price. Naturally, this uh, a need that we work on certification, that we work on criteria, so that the market can, uh, uh, can uh, work on a transparent way where the prices are attached to certain characteristics of the fuel that we are going to use. We have a question in from the audience, so I'll put this to you. It's on solar. And the question is, there's always discussion about the lowest solar prices in the sunniest places, which can be deceptive. So how do you scale solar in colder climates where there is less sun prices are higher and would require greater transmission infrastructure. The question goes on to say, how do we make sure we don't paint a broad brush for solar's low cost competitiveness by using the lowest cost in the sunniest place as our benchmark? It's a good question. If you have agreed that's a law for all the interconnectivity. So naturally the, the cost of producing the energy will be, will be relevant in that context. But uh, I wish also to say that when we talk about the energy cost for solar, for example, we work on the basis of average. So for having a solar that is convenient, if we compare with uh, traditional sources, it's not only in the Emirates that they have one, one, dollar 35, one cent for 30, 0.35 cent for, uh, for kilowatt, it's nothing, or Portugal. And the average in all part of, almost in all parts of the world, solar and wind are more competitive than the others. And this also apply for, for hydro and the other uh, <clears throat> renewable sources. And I guess to that point, how do you make renewable energy affordable and more cost effective in emerging markets and the developing world? I know that's a big question, but perhaps just give us a summary of some of the work that the agency is doing in that field. You know, what, what, uh, there are two ways and uh, as I told you before, one is the, to work with them on, uh, we do the, the, the assessment of their potential for renewables. We are working on their energy plan. And now from their energy plan, we are capturing idea for projects that we can put in the climate investment platform to investment for that we are going to organize and try to find the resources for it. Imagine that in a few months, we have reached 300 partners. World Bank, as Infrastructure Bank, uh, uh, pension funds, development agency, all have come to, 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 to be part of this exercise. On the other part, we have a, a getting idea for projects. In a few weeks, we got 108 idea for projects that we are elaborating to make them bankable. So this is the, the strength of ARENA. No one has our knowledge basis. If we will be able to put this knowledge basis to support countries in uh, coming with ideas for projects that may be prepared in a way that may attract the attention of the bank, the multilateral bank system of developed agency. So we are ready to make the deal. And we will de dedicate all our efforts to make this happen. Francesco, it's been such a pleasure to speak with you this evening. Thank you so much for your time today. This is the first time we've spoke. I hope it's not the last and we'll look forward to chatting with you on CNBC very, very soon. But thank you again for joining us and all my best for the work that you do in the year ahead. If I can say in Italia, grazie Dan. And see you soon after. Have a great year. And uh, just a reminder to all of our viewers as well, you can continue to, the, to view the forum agenda and other relevant uh, event information on the Atlantic Council app. So make sure you check that out. And also please join our next session, which is uh, scheduled very shortly. It's called The Road to Glasgow, Crucial Outcomes of COP26. So with that, we'll hand it back over to our organizers and thanks for tuning in. Dan, thank you so much. Uh, what a great conversation with uh, Director General La Camera. Uh, really excited about the next panel on COP26. Wonder what your key takeaway was from that, uh, the, the conversation with La Camera. My key takeaway? Your key takeaway, yes. 
Well, I think we're in such a fascinating time for this industry. And one of the questions that I asked was how soon before we see scaled renewables as a viable alternative to fossil fuels? And I thought he had an excellent response to that question. Uh, clearly, this depends on the countries that you look at around the world and the technology that they have um, and, uh, and, and how they're enabled by that technology to progress that change. But uh, also the challenge that uh, I think we face at the moment is purely the economic environment that we're operating in. Um, one of the questions I didn't get to ask was, has this current economic climate perhaps delayed or set back uh, this quest that we see around the world to progress towards a greater, bull, a, a greater uh, mix of renewables in the energy mix. And, um, you know, that's probably something that I'd be looking at into the future. Um, what type of progress are we going to see? Well, I think that remains to be seen, but clearly, um, given the comments that we've just heard, it's, uh, it's quite obvious to me that we're on the right track and in very safe hands. And thank you. And I think that's the absolute right question. You know, what, what has COVID done to the energy system? Um, has it accelerated uh, the energy transition or are the risks, um, are, are there risks that it's created that it will slow it down? Um, I think a lot of those, uh, those outcomes will be decided by the decisions that governments make in the lead up to COP26. Um, as, as we all know, COP26 was postponed for a year because of COVID and now will take place in November in Glasgow. Um, the, the energy transition, uh, it, is one of the five campaigns of the United Kingdom COP presidency. So they really focused on energy transition.